I received an email from a viewer named Gilad Levy who had a maths question for me pertaining to the game of Dungeons and Dragons. Challenge your imagination to come alive. Which is why I've got all these ridiculous dice out. Big fan of crazy dice. I've got like the D4, so D for dice and then four for four sides. D12, D20, classic. I mean, just for overkill. I've also got my D60 and D120, which is completely unnecessary. And of course, the staple of the dice world, a candy jar's worth of D6s. Anyone who visits me in the office can just um, grab a couple of these as a treat. And so Gilad's question was not actually about the numbers or the geometry or anything on this dice. It's about a modification you can make to Dungeons and Dragons. So if you're rolling a D20 for some reason, like you need a high number so something good happens uh, to your character. So I just roll this roll 12. Not bad. But what if you want to give that player an advantage? What you can do is bring in a second identical dice. So instead of rolling just the one dice, you roll one dice and a second phantom dice. So on the main dice I've got 11 and on the phantom dice I've got four. Okay, at that point you can choose whichever one you want. So you pick the better one, the higher one. So you go, oh, I rolled an 11. So every time you roll, if you have with advantage, you roll two dice, pick your favorite, in this case the 16, and discard the other one. And Gilad's question was, if you're rolling two dice, picking the best one so you have an advantage, what is the new average value? What is the expected value from rolling identical dice at the same time? They did look online first, which I appreciate people doing that before they email me. But all I could find was people putting values into spreadsheets like on a case by case basis and then taking the average manually. And don't get me wrong, big fan of spreadsheets, but we can do better. My zeroth step, as always, was just to simulate it in software. So I put together some terrible Python code. Uh, this is it here. It's not great. I'll link to it below if you want to check it out. It just rolls two dice a million times. Keeps track of which was the maximum value, adds them up and gives you the average at the end. And I've got my laptop here running that exact code, which uh, you can now see next to me here. So uh, this line, that's just saying run some Python code that I've called higher of two rolls. And if we run that, it asks you how many sides on your dice. Let's do the D20, it's doing a million rolls, and there it is. The average result of rolling to and taking the highest is about 13.829. You think, well, is that accurate? Doing it a million times. We can uh, redo the same thing again. Let's do another 20. This time, 13.83. Okay, so we're always getting about 13.83 uh, for 20, give or take. So we can be reasonably confident that's roughly the right value. And of course, uh, let me clear that. You can do that, for, we did that for, uh, let's you know do the D12, then you're gonna get an average of hmm, about eight and a half. We try it for our friends, the D6 over here. It's gonna be around about 4.47-ish. So now we can get these results and we're confident they're correct. Now we have to crack the logic behind it. With some tweaks to the code, instead of just getting the average value, you can of course get it to spit out the probability of getting any given value. And that's exactly what Gilad did, and they did a plot. For the record, a single D20, every single face has a one in 20 chance of coming up. That means they're 5% each. And if we did the chart for this, it would be a bar chart where every single number is 5%, perfectly flat. And I've not joined it together as a line because it doesn't make sense to have an in-between value. I've just done a bar for every single value to show you the percentage. And what Gillette had plotted was the same thing, but with rolling for advantage. And you can see you get a perfectly straight line. It starts with a 0.25% chance of getting a one. And then it goes up half a percentage point every single number you go up on the dice until 20, which is the most likely, is the biggest, is a 9.75% chance. And we're like, that's interesting. And we'd run the simulation over and over and we'd check the numbers and they add up to one. So the whole thing holds together. So now we had two questions. One was, why when you plot the probability for each of the different faces with advantage, do you get this perfectly straight arrangement of the probabilities? And secondly, the average, Gilad noticed, is always about two thirds of the maximum value. I say about two thirds, it's gonna be some weird number probably involving E, it won't be that simple. But they had spotted roughly two thirds and we had to answer both those questions. And uh, my goodness, 
I was not expecting the result we got. This video is brought to you by Jane Street, who are also supporting the 2022 International Mathematical Olympiad. Try a sample puzzle at the end of this video. Jane Street have actually provided a brand new IMO style puzzle that you can try. We'll put it at the end of the video, but it's based on an icosahedron. Not the dice, just the actual shape. Super interesting. Check that out at the end. But for now, we're going to try and crack what's going on with the probabilities when you roll for advantage. We're not going to do the d20 though, that's a little bit too much. We're going to start with our friend, the d6. Oops, that's gone. Here I have some d6, and we can look at what happens if you roll two distinguishable d6. So I've now got a green one and a blue one at the same time. And uh, each of them could have, oh, I've got two fives, there you go. Each of them could have any of six possible values, a four and a three. So we can do a two-way plot where we've got all the values the blue can have on one axis, all the values the green can have on the other axis. And inside each square, we can put what that combination is. And importantly, each of those squares has a one in 36 chance of happening, because that's just six squared. We could now go through and color in what values we would get if we rolled that pair and we picked the highest. So the only way to get one is the bottom corner. So there's a one in 36 chance of doing that. There are three ways you can get two. If you get any of these, you would choose two as the biggest number. So that's a three out of 36 chance. Here's all the ways you could get three, and then four, and then five, and finally um, six. And then I realized what I was looking at is the same bar chart from before. In fact, we can just stand these up, and there you are. That's our bar chart, because the probabilities are proportional to the number of squares. And that's why you get that straight line. It's because if you add consecutive odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, and so on, you get the square numbers, one, four, nine, and up, in this case, 36. And I was so excited when I realized this. And so we can see the numbers for the case of the D6, because it's one over 36, three over 36, five over 36, and so on, 36. It's just the number of faces squared. So if we want to go back to our D20s, it's just one over 20 squared. Wow, one over 400. That's 0.25%, which is why we had 0.25% likelihood for getting a one if you roll with advantage. And then it goes up by double that every single time. So the next one up is 0.75% all the way up to 9.75%. That's where the straight line comes from. I'm so pleased when you start with a probability question and then you can turn it into a geometry question that then gives you your probability bar chart for free. Ah, so pleasing. But now, where does the average come from? It's working it out time. So we're gonna do this in general for an n-sided dice. Bear with me. Okay, so we don't know how many sides the dice has, we got n sides, but we know it's gonna be like this. It's gonna get two higher every single time until you get to n. Each of these represents a probability of one over n squared, because we know there's a total of n squared of these in, because if you clap them all back down again, you get your square. So good. The question now is for each of these values on the dice, which I'm gonna call these x, um, just because we've already used n, how do we know how many blocks are above them? Well, these are just the odd numbers. So that's 2x, uh, let's go minus one, so it starts at the right point. So, uh, so we know each of these has two times x minus one blocks above them. And the probability is then that times one over n squared. So I'm gonna put that on n squared. So there you go. So for any value x on an n-sided dice, this is the probability of getting that if you roll two of them with advantage. So what's the average value? Well, it's the chance of getting a value of one times one, chance of getting two times two, chance of getting three times three. This is the chance of getting x times x. And then you've got to add them all up. Future Matt here in the edit because I realized past Matt was getting a bit confused. I did have to do the summation of each of these values, the probabilities times 
the value of each face x but i put a one over n at the front which you can see there i was getting ahead to where i wanted to do the ratio and then i changed my mind so later on you can see when i was bringing the uh one over n squared at the front because it's independent of x in the summation i put an n there to cancel it out i don't know what i was thinking but the point is it all works don't worry about the top line everything is perfect from here so it ends up being uh one over n squared outside the sum of what we had before but now over here we've only got 2x minus 1 times x and i just worked out what that was before and i remembered it it's 1 over n squared and then this thing here is n on 6 times n plus 1 times 4n minus 1 and that's it and you're like hang on i can cancel this out because if i've got an n squared there and an n there what i've actually got out the front is just a uh, one over six n and uh, that's it that's our equation and sure enough it works if you put n equals 20 into that you get out 13.825 exactly what we got from our simulations if you put in n equals six you get the same result that we got from our simulations this is the equation for the average value for any n-sided dice if you roll two of them with advantage. All we have to do now is work out where that ratio of approximately two-thirds comes from. And that's not so bad to do because the ratio we're talking about is the ratio of this average to n. So we just got to divide this whole thing by n, which yes, I could have just squared that n. But what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to rewrite that as 1 over 6 n plus 1 on n, 4n minus 1 on n. Convince yourself that's the same. These are all multiplied together. And we want to know what is the limit as n goes to infinity. Like uh, in theory, as we approach an infinitely large n-sided dice, what would this ratio be? Well, if, well, a 6 is a sixth. That's not changing. n plus 1 over n, as n goes to infinity, that's just going to equal, that's going to equal 1. That's easy, put that in there, All right, okay. And uh, 4n minus 1 over n, as n goes to infinity, that's just going to equal 4. So actually, it's 1 sixth times 1 times 4, 4 on 6, it equals exactly 2 thirds. I couldn't believe it. So it's not just like, oh, this is roughly 2 thirds, it's probably the inverse of root 2, it's probably something involving e, no! It's exactly two thirds. I, so there you are. So in general, just as a rule of thumb, if you're rolling two dice with advantage, the average result you're gonna get is two thirds of whatever the dice is. Easy. But hang on. What if we were rolling three dice? Hey, Stand Up Maths, Matt here. So I'm building a model of our diagram from before out of dice. So it's now the dice chart made from dice, which is deeply pleasing, but it does mean you have to ignore the numbers. So I'm just using these to represent the different regions, little areas in our two-way uh, sample space from before. So you've got uh, what the first dice could be going you know, across horizontally, one, two, three, four, and eventually you know, I could build five and six. And now the second dice goes straight up. So one, two, three, four, and then five and six. And so the blue, is one one, so one's the biggest number. The orange ones here are all the combinations where they're ones and twos, and so two's the biggest number, and then you've got where three's the biggest number, four's the biggest number, and I could build five and six, same as before. However, we now need to add a third die. So instead of having a 2D plot with two axes, we're gonna swing this sideways and have a third axis coming out in this direction. We've got three, perfectly good dimensions. Let's use them. So now I can start building up this, here we go, direction. Oh, um, I need to put these, wait, I'm gonna take these off for a second. Oh, I should have glued these together. So I did, there it is, right? So there's the shell now of, in the 3D plot, all the combinations of the three D6s, which are ones and twos. We can then add on the shell for uh, threes, because it's now one, two, three. So these are all the dice where three is the biggest value. And then you've got all the fours, uh, all the fives. Finally, uh, all the ones where six is the biggest uh, value on the outer shell. And now you can see how much of an advantage rolling three and picking the highest is. If you rolled a single D6 by itself, one and six are equally likely. If you roll three 
and pick the biggest, there's only one, one of these out of uh, 216 possible options where you get all ones, and there's 91 cases where six is the biggest number. So instead of being equal, it's now one to 91. Just ridiculous. And these aren't 2D areas anymore. They're not one over 36, which is the number of faces squared. They're one over the number of faces cubed. So they're one over 216. So each of these volumes is a one over 216 chance of happening. There are 216 of them. And then you can work out how many there are from each layer. But unlike the odd numbers, there's no obvious formula for these values. I mean, they must have some kind of pattern, and they do. These are the centered hexagonal numbers. So if I hold that one nice and still right in the middle, and you get that in focus, you've got one right in the center, and then you've got concentric rings, which are hexagonal numbers. So there's one, and then six around it, and then so on. It's so good. And we can use that equation to do the working out for the three dice case. Let's do it. <laughs> as soon as I get up. Ugh. Our equation for the odd numbers is easy enough. It's just 2x minus 1. And if you're unfamiliar, the odd numbers go 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. And x is position 1, gives you 1. When x is 2, position 2, it gives you 3. Now, the center hexagonal numbers, they go 1, 7, pretty sure it's 19. Yes, 19, 37. I've written them down, down there. 37. Uh, 61, 91, and that 91, that was the final outer shell of this, and those are all the shells below. We need now some formula, where you put in x is one and you get one, you put in x is two, you get seven, and uh, that happens to be, written it down as well, it's three, actually let's do this in blue, so it matches, it is three times x outside of x minus one plus one. You will occasionally see that with a plus, where they've zero indexed this list, but I'm, I'm against my better judgment uh, starting from one. So there's our formula for how big each shell is of uh, all these different ones here. So now we can get rid of uh, all this ridiculous extra bits, and we're going to build that up into the equation for what the average value is when you roll three dice and with advantage pick the biggest value. So first of all, that's the value of each shell. We need the probability of each shell, which is the number of cubes multiplied by the probability that each volume represents, which as we established before, is just one over the number of faces squared. So I can chuck an N, oh sorry, cubed. Chuck a cubed down there. That's the probability. We're now gonna multiply that by the value, which is the whole thing by H1 is X. Then we need to add them all up from the first face, equals one up to the nth face. Future Matt here to again clarify, past Matt got a bit excited and put the one over n at the front because that's when you want to compare the average value as a ratio to the number of sides. But then I decided in hindsight, actually I want to look at just the equation for the average first and then divide it by n to get the ratio. Sorry, back to past Matt. And I can give you the grand conclusion, the average value if you roll three dice and just pick the highest is one over this time 4n, pretty exciting, times n plus one times 3n minus one. Nice and neat. Check that out. And so we can go through and plug a bunch of values in. I did put in the value for a, a d20. So if your n equals a 20 sided dice, you now your average value for a D20 comes out at 15.4875. There we go. So uh, just over three quarter. It's about three quarters. Before it was two thirds. Oh, that's too neat. Too neat to not be true. Okay, let's find out, let's find out. So I'm gonna get rid of our working out down here. Oh my goodness. We've now got at the top there, that's our value for the average. We wanna know now what that is relative to n. So we wanna divide that by n again. So now this is the average on n. So we just put a squared down there. And then, oh, actually, that means we could rearrange it. We could take that n squared like we did before. And we could chuck one over there. We could chuck one over there. And now we wanna know as what's the limit as n goes to, 
infinity of this, well, it's going to be the fourth is still going to be the same. That's going to be one times one. That's going to be three. It is. It's three quarters. There you are. Okay. So turns out if you roll two dice and pick the highest is two thirds. If you roll, and just for comparison, I'm going to put that over there. So when we had two dice, the M, oh no wait, M. If we had M dice, so we had two dice case, that was two thirds. This here, this is our three dice. This is the M equals three dice case, it's three quarters. The big question now on everyone's lips is if we worked out the M equals four case, you roll four dice, you pick the highest. Will the pattern continue? Will it be four fifths? There's only one way to find out, and it involves hypercubes. Right, if we're rolling four dice at once, we're gonna need four orthogonal directions on our space of all possible results, which means we're gonna need more dice, more glue, and more dimensions. And I'm not gonna start gluing together, as tempting as it is, hypercubes, but in theory, each time you add another number on the dice, you just, it's a bigger and bigger hypercube of possibilities. And you have to work out the four dimensional shells, how many 4D content, like hyper volumes there are in, uh, and we, you know what? We're just gonna work it out using algebra because we know what the equation is for each of these, like each of the shells in four dimensions because it's just the difference between two consecutive hypercubes. It's X to the four, subtract X minus one, to the four, and spoiler, we could have done that um, with all the other ones. Anyway, point is, we've now got this sequence of numbers that goes 1, 15, 65, 175, 269. Uh, what's the pattern? Well, these are the rhombic dodecahedral numbers. So we went from the odd numbers to the hexagonal numbers to now, this is the rhombic dodecahedron, the greatest of all the dodecahedra. And that actually, makes sense because if you've got a square, the, the diagonal cross section, like the, the center cross section of a square is a line. And actually that's why when you look at it from the corner, you see a line, but it's wrapped around. And the middle cross section of a cube is a hexagon, which is why if you look at it perfectly corner on, it looks like a hexagon and they're centered hexagonal numbers. And as some of you may know, if you get a 4D cube, and you cut it perfectly in half on the, on the hyper diagonal, the cross section of the 4D cube is a 3D rhombic dodecahedron. It's so pleasing. Think of it like the 3D hexagon. And, and that's why the numbers, if you add together consecutive centered rhombic dodecahedral numbers, you get the hypercube numbers. Ah, maths. The point is, we've got the equation. We can crunch it through it like we did before. Indeed, I've done it. Give it a go. It's good fun. And it ends up four fifths. It's four fifths. If you roll four, you don't have to worry about the hypercubes and the rhombic dodecahedra, all that jazz. If you roll four dice and pick the highest value, you will get on average four fifths of whatever the value of the dice is. Sort of. Some of you have already thought, does this work in the opposite direction? So it seems very, very likely that if you roll M dice, you end up on average, if you just take the highest one, getting M divided by M plus one times however many faces you've got. That seems very, very likely. And we haven't proved that carries on going up. Pretty sure it does. If you go backwards, you put in the case for one dice, a single one, M, it should be half. It's not half. It's, well, it would be, it is in the case of, if there are infinitely many faces, as it tends to infinity, which is how we were working out, it's exactly half, but it's not exactly half, it's a half uh, of the value. So the average volt roll on a D6 is three and a half. The average roll on a D, um, D20, here we go, is 10 and a half. On my D60, 30 and a half, because there's an even number of uh, faces and you're always getting a whole number. And in fact, before, when we worked out, the average for rolling three D20s, 15, which is three quarters, and a half. So I, my conjecture is, it's always for M dice rolled with advantage, it's M divided by M plus one times N plus a half. Feel free 
to prove, disprove, or extend my conjecture. I think it's good enough for the size and number of roles in a standard D&D game. So there you are. If anyone ever says there's no practical reason why you want to know that the central cross section of a 4D hypercube is a 3D rhombic dodecahedron, now you can just throw some dice in their face. Super applied mathematics. So anyway, thank you so much for watching this video and thanks to Jane Street, who not only sponsor this video and my channel, they also sponsor the International Mathematical Olympiad, which is happening this year from the 6th to 16th of July in Oslo, Norway, and it's where teams all around the world send six pre-university math students to compete in like, it's like the math version of the Hunger Games. It's like the number games. They all have to run out and get like the best calculator, but there's nothing to do like that. No, they, they solve very difficult math problems, and oh my goodness, they have some serious problems. So Jane Street have set a sample problem if you would like to try it. And they say, imagine you're on a huge icosahedron. So actually like this, like, like, a, like a D20, but ignore the numbers. Imagine you start on a random vertex and you can choose to walk to any of the other vertices nearby. But when you get there, you're completely disorientated. You can't see where you came from. You can't see any of the other vertices. All you can do is leave a marker, leave a stone. That you can have as many stones as you want of as many different colors as you want. So you leave a stone of some color and then you walk to another vertex. But when you get there, again, totally disorientated. But you can look down to see if you've previously left a stone there and you can leave or do whatever you want with your marked stones. And the question is, at the beginning of your journey, what is the minimum number of stones you have to take with you so you know for certain at some point you can say, I am definitely at the exact opposite vertex of where I started. And they've got all the exact wording of that if you want to double check it. And they've got some other variations of the same puzzle in terms of being on infinite planes or being on other shapes at uh, janestreet.com slash IMO. 2022. So you can check that out. You can see the puzzle. Try it for yourself. It's good. Oh my goodness. It's fiendish, but you can give it a go. And of course, you can keep an eye on the IMO. See who wins the number games this year. Uh, and so there you are. Huge thanks to Jane Street for making the IMO possible and indeed my channel.